Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath services. This Sabbath, I'm going to have the full time for Sabbath services. So to begin with, we're going to start out with understanding a simple but difficult scripture. And the reason is that I got an email saying concerning Matthew 19 that when Jesus answered the young man, he said, you know the commandments, and therefore, we don't have to keep them. Which tells you what? All people know the commandments, but they say what? We don't have to keep them. All right, let's go to Matthew 19. We'll, we'll read it here. Then we'll look at the parallel account in Mark and in also Luke. And we will see that there is no way that you can conclude from what Jesus said or what the young man said that you don't have to keep the commandments of God. See, people are all locked into this Protestant thought that if you just have your little confessional and call Franklin Graham at this number or whoever the minister is, that you are secure in heaven. You know more secure in heaven than you are whatever you could compare it to because there's no comparison, all right? Matthew 19, verse 16. Now at that time one came to him and said, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, God. But if you desire to enter into life, Keep the commandments. Nothing could be clearer, right? Okay. Then he said to him, which, and, he, and Jesus, Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what's the first thing that all Protestants do when they read that? They are locked into a great lie, which is this. He didn't say the Sabbath. And they don't have the wit about them to understand that in Judea and Galilee, Sabbath was the law of the land. And everybody kept the Sabbath one way or another. So he didn't have to mention it. But notice he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Is that in the Ten Commandments? No, it's not. All right, let's come to the account in Mark 10. Mark 10. And we will see it's just a little different, but we will see that Jesus did say, you know the commandments. Verse 17. And as he went out to the road, one came running up to him and knelt down before him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? Now, a lot of people can't figure that out. Why did Jesus say, There's none good but one God? Why didn't he say, Well, I'm glad you recognize me. I'm the only one who's good on the earth. Because he had human nature. And as long as he had human nature, because of the evil potential of human nature, he was not good in the way that God looks at good. See, people 
look at good with a different perspective. Okay. Now, verse 19, you know the commandments. Okay, there it is, just like she wrote on her email. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. Uh, you shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he answered and said to him, Master, I have what? Kept. All these from my youth. Okay. So there is keeping. There is knowing. And there is keeping. Now the Protestants know the commandments. But do they keep them? Do they understand them? No. Nope. All right. Let's come to the account in Luke 18. So you see, now here, here's another thing to understand in the way of Bible study and so forth. Get all the scriptures that pertain to what is being discussed. Because there's part here, and there's part there, and there's part someplace else. All right? Now we will see the missing ingredient after we cover it here in Luke 18, verse 18, okay? And a certain ruler. Now we learned a little bit more about him, right? He's a ruler. Ask him, saying, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Then Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except one, God. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And he said, I have kept. Why didn't Jesus say? You don't need to keep them anymore, I'm here to do away with the law. Well, he didn't. I have kept all these commandments from my youth. And after hearing these things, Jesus said to him, you still lack one thing. Imagine he was thinking, only one? Okay, notice what Jesus said. Sell everything that you have and distribute to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now, why did Jesus say that? Because there was another commandment that he was breaking in his own mind, which he didn't understand. Okay, we'll see that in just a minute. But when he heard these things, he became very sorrowful, for he was quite rich. And when Jesus saw him become so sorrowful, he said, how difficult it is for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And then the disciples said, well, then who can be saved? All right. Question, why? Did Jesus say, sell everything that you have? Let's come to Ezekiel 14, and let's learn a lesson. Because commandment keeping does not begin with outward action. Commandment keeping begins with inward thought. And God wants us to think. But God wants us to think correctly. And he wants us to understand what he wants. So let's read Ezekiel 14, beginning in verse 1. Because here is what was in the mind of that man. 
All right, verse 1. And some of the elders of Israel, okay, now he was a rich man, he was a leader, came to me and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts. I want you to think about that. How many idols do we have in our hearts? See, this is why conversion is of the heart and of the mind and everything about it. Okay? They have set up idols in their hearts. Was not all the riches of that man idols in his heart? Was he willing to give them up? No. What did Jesus say about coming to him? If anyone come to me and, and love father, mother, brother, sister, so forth, more than me, he is not worthy of me. Huh. Think about that. Now, we don't know how much he had because he had a lot. But you see, there's another lesson we can learn from it, which is this. The riches of God that he's going to give us is greater than any riches we can have on the earth. And the greatest riches of all that God is going to give us is what? Eternal life, right? Which you cannot buy which you cannot produce yourself, it must come from God. Okay? They have set up idols in, the, in their hearts and put a stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. That's what happened. Wasn't that a stumbling block for that young man? Yep. He couldn't get over it. If he really wanted eternal life, he would have said, Master, I will sell all that I have and come and follow you. But he didn't. So here is the question. Should I at all be inquired of them? Now, that puts a lot of people in the same category who think that they're coming to God. See? And they are so blinded because they have believed so many lies that supposedly the preacher says come from the Bible that they are adamant in refusing to recognize that. Because those are idols in the minds of those who are false Christians who think that they're truly converted. But they're not. All right, verse 4. Therefore speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart and puts the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and comes to the prophet, that means come to the prophet of God, I, the Lord, will answer him according to the multitude of his idols. See, now think about this. You've got to understand this. Whatever Jesus said to the young man to do, that was from God, correct? We'll see about what that is in a little bit here. Okay, so verse 5 now, Ezekiel 14, so that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they have deserted me for their idols, all of them. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from your abominations. I want you to think about that. 
We'll talk about some of the difficulties we're going through a little later. But I want you to understand something. Here is one major sin that is so predominant in America. And we've covered this before, and it has to do with abortion. Because abortion is murdering the unborn of single women. And how many are there? Millions. 64% of them want abortion to be legal. Which tells you what? That idol in their minds cuts them off from God. And they are so deceived that they don't even know what a woman is anymore. And now they understand with all this transgender stuff, what do they understand? Transgender operations are 100% unsuccessful. They can pretend in a lie in their minds that a woman is a man, but she's not, or a man is a woman, but he's not. And you can take all of the drugs, you can take all of the surgery, you can take everything that they offer to you to perpetuate your lie, to keep you locked into Satan, the devil, that you can't see the truth. 100% doesn't work. So God says, repent and turn yourselves from the idols and turn away your faces from your abominations. Abortion is abomination. Sabbath breaking is an abomination. For every one of the house of Israel or stranger who lives in Israel, who separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart, puts a stumbling block of his iniquities before his face and comes to the prophet to ask of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him. Now, we don't know how God is going to answer him. But it could arrange from difficult times all the way to death. Okay? Because here's what happens. When people set their face against God and people refuse to follow God, what does God do? Verse 8. I will set my face against that man and I will make him for a sign and a proverb and I will cut him off from the midst of my people and you shall know that I am the Lord. So all of these transsexual things, all of these operations are going to be a testimony to every human being and those who have them that what? They are 100% failures because your gender is on every cell and gene of your body. All right. Verse 9. And the prophet. So he talks about the prophet. Now there are a lot of prophets. I've got a whole a whole page in a newspaper where in Canada all of these churches are accepting homosexuals to come into the congregations. That means all those pastors who do it are deceived. Just one example. If he is deceived and speaks a word, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Now think about that. Does God react to it? Yes. How do you suppose we came from being a normally moral people 
all the way to the abominations that we have in the society today because it lays at the doorstep of every minister and every evangelist and all of those who profess the name of Christ and will not keep the commandments of God and will not teach the truth of God and will not follow the word of God. I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity and the punishment of the prophet shall even be as the punishment of him that seeks unto him. All right, let's read one more verse. So that the house of Israel may never again go astray from me. The ultimate result is God's going to straighten it out. But there are too many people who think they can straighten it out themselves. All right? Now, let's come back to Luke 10. Let's see something very interesting. Let's see, let's see the obligation of, of the minister, or like it says in Ezekiel, the prophet, the one who is supposed to be speaking for God, Luke 10. All right? Because this becomes very important. Uh, and I want you to understand this concerning the word of God. Okay, And why study is so important. You can't just say, well, I understand this doctrine, I don't need to study it. Or I understand this, and I don't need to study it. See? You'll find over the years that when you go back over it, the same thing you thought you knew, you learned a whole lot more about it because you have a greater knowledge of the scriptures bringing to bear on what you're reading. Let's pick it up here in verse 16. Now, this has to do with the word of God. The one who hears you, that is, if you're speaking the words of God, hears me. Think about that. That is the responsibility. Now, I'm going to amplify this tomorrow when we have our elders' conference tomorrow, okay? And the one who rejects you rejects me. In other words, if they would speak the truth of God, like God said, then they could represent God, okay? But the one who rejects those who speak the truth of God rejects Christ, now, notice the next sentence here. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Now, think of that. The great sovereign of the universe, God the Father. Okay? This tells us an awful lot. And it tells us when we answer questions from the Bible we need to do it thoroughly. We need to cover it completely. We need to make it so that it becomes a part of everyone's thinking and way of being because the blessing comes from God the Father. See, It's not that there's an inherent thing about the one who is preaching that is superior to anyone who is hearing. That's not true. Because those of us who are elders are to be stewards. Now, a steward is someone who takes the assets, the money, the goods of the master and gets a profit by trading and doing what he's to do to bring it back to the master. But he has to be faithful. Okay. Well, this is why God told all of the apostles that you are not to be like the Gentiles and rule over the people. All of us who are elders, we are here to teach the word of God and teach it with truth and teach it with conviction and teach it rightly. 
rightly dividing the word of God, as Paul wrote. And that does not exalt us at all. Because we are to be as the servant not as the overlord. And Peter made that very clear. All right. Now, I want to cover some other things before we get into the main message today. Okay. Now, I mentioned this to you before, and I hope a lot of you have downloaded it, but you need to download it. The Secret Speech of General Chi uh, Hao Kian in 2003. Now, it's important for you to read it in order for you to understand what is China doing to America? What are their designs? What are their attitudes? What do they propose to do? Now, I'll tell you one thing. Any Chinaman that drives down in the Midwest and sees mile after mile after mile of crops, corn, wheat, barley, whatever, he thinks of China, where they don't have that. They have roughly 7 to 10 percent of their land for cultivating. Everything else must be imported. So when they drive down the Midwest, they want this land. Are they buying it? Yes, they are. Have other countries also bought it? Yes, they have. So you read what their plan was in 2003. And you will see that it is coming to pass today. Give you one hint. They say the United States should secede all of Western of America to China. Why? Because they were here first. Okay. Here's another one. Biden wants to ban gas generators that generate electricity. Okay. Biden and the Democrats truly want to destroy America. And why are they in power to do so? Because this nation has tur blatantly turned its back on God. That's why. Blatantly. In every one of the Ten Commandments of God and all of the, the sexual morality commandments that God has, a vast majority of people are breaking them with impunity. Okay, now here's an organization in God We Trust makes a comeback. Well, if you don't come back to God and truth, it isn't going to do any good. Now, here's another one concerning debt. Guess how much debt America is accumulating in new T-bills every single day? Five billion a day. That's a staggering amount. They can't bring themselves to bring a balanced budget, and they can't bring themselves to the point that they can, can have a surplus to pay down any of the debt. They will never, ever, ever, ever pay down any of the debt, and if it continues the way it is, they're looking for a $50 trillion ceiling on the debt that's going to hit America, and it's going to be a repeat of the Weimar Republic. So you need to read that, all right? Guess what else is happening? 
Do the bank leaders, the top bank leaders, know what's going to happen? Do they know that inflation is coming? Do they know that a, a big economic crash is coming? And it's going to come because longtime Goldman Sachs executives, one, Jeffrey Curry, who has been with them 27 years and is one of the leading men in the whole financial system in the world. He has left along with 27 other top executives. The rats are leaving the sinking ship. Now then, what should you do? You need to have a supply of food. You need to have a supply of, of money. It won't go very far if you can get yourself some silver. I recommend you buy yourself some silver. Gold will be too expensive here pretty quickly. It's hovering at $2,000 an ounce. Silver is hovering right at about 28 to 32 an ounce. Don't think of that. But you could, if you have enough money, you can pick up some of those silver dollars and you can keep them for when the dollar collapses and you need to buy something, then you have something in your hand to buy it. See? Because it will get just like it was with the Weimar Republic. It took a wheelbarrow to, to bring in billions of marks to buy a loaf of bread. Okay. Now then, here's another one to watch for concerning the mark of the beast. Scientists control human DNA with electricity. In a leap forward, a study reports. Okay. Now, last of all, I want to show you this picture. When they say we're coming after your kids, they're not kidding. There it is. Look at all of those books in Barnes and Noble. I've got the list of all of those who printed them, who wrote them, who did the illustrations. Why are they right up there in the, in the front when you go in to Barnes and Noble? Because they want everyone to get into a situation where there will be a decrease in population to save the planet. That's an ultimate goal of the global warming thing. Okay? Now then, I was stunned watching the news last night. How many saw the news last night? Well, you missed one of the biggest events that has taken place. Merritt Garland and Joe Biden and the ones behind Joe Biden that are pulling all of the strings have agreed to try Donald Trump and make him be in the court all during the campaign for the 2024 election. Now, there's one thing that I hope they really catch because that could dismiss that whole case of January 6th that they're trying to bring on Donald Trump, dismiss it completely. You know what that is? In order to properly try Donald Trump, they have to have access to all records, all videos, all emails, but guess what the January 6th committee, the Democrats, did to all of those? They destroyed them. 
So I don't know if they're going to go to the Supreme Court and have the Supreme Court rule that you cannot proceed with this trial unless there is all of the evidence available. And if you've destroyed it, you have destroyed the case. So like Donald Trump said, they're not only after me, they're after everyone in America. And all of these things that are coming down are not just political problems. They're not just educational problems. They're not just medical problems. They are spiritual problems. Because we have rejected God. Now remember what God said. If you reject me, I will reject you. Now we're beginning to see what it's going to be like in this nation for rejecting God. It's no small matter because the majority of the people even those who are supposed to be good and upright have not come to God in repentance and humility and seeking God's mercy the way only God could give. They think they can solve it all by political means or by whatever other means that may come along. But they won't be able to do it. Okay? Now then, let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll be back in 20. Now let's continue on with Sabbath services. I want to uh, bring some things to your mind first, remind you of them. Be sure and get the book, God's Plan for Mankind, revealed by his Sabbath and Holy Days. Okay? Now, this is important. The second edition is greatly expanded and it will give you a whole lot of knowledge and understanding about the Sabbath and the Holy Days and why they are important to God. Now, we'll see that a little bit later, okay? There it is. God's plan for mankind, and he's called us to carry it out when Christ returns. So you need to get this book. We send it to you at no cost. Now, commercial continues. <laughs> we have a hundred more of the Restoring the Original Bible by Ernest Martin. A hundred more. Now, we'll send it to you. You can call. You can email. You can write. We'll get it to you. Now, one warning, you will see that he has some things when it comes to theology not correct. But he has a great history of the canonization of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, this is important for you to know because the attack against the Bible is going to come full throttle. They will label it as lies. They will hate it. They will come after those who believe it. Then also the new book that we have, the Apostle Paul's teachings on God's laws. We have a, a lot of these, and you can use these to pass out to your friends and your neighbors. And then we have one coming off the press this week. The Holy Spirit 
the power of God, a scriptural perspective. Now, this will be one of our most important books that we have produced. And books cannot be, with the flip of a switch, eliminated. Let's continue on. What about all the problems facing America and the world? Not just us. Okay. Let's begin in Jeremiah 18. Now, we've covered this in the past, but this is important because it tells us what God is doing. Now, as we're turning to Jeremiah 18, remember that in the book of Revelation, it talks about the seven spirits of God that go throughout the whole world. And this is how God knows what's going on in the world. Okay. Now, Let's come to Jeremiah 18 and see what God says. Verse 1. And the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he was working at his wheel. And a vessel that he made of clay was ruined in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Okay. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, now here's the lesson. Now, why did he use clay? Because all human beings are made of dust and to dust you shall return. So in forming Adam, God used what we would call clay. So this is showing what God is going to do. Verse 5, O house of Israel, and America has all 12 tribes in it. In Europe, now we have an interesting thing in Europe. Germany is Assyria, which includes Germany, Western Czechoslovakia, and Austria. They're all German-speaking. Okay? Now, Surrounding them are all of the 12 tribes of Israel except Manasseh and Ephraim. Very interesting. So there are many prophecies that apply to the children of Israel concerning Assyria, but there are also other prophecies that apply to Ephraim and Manasseh separate from those that are there in close hand with Assyria. And Assyria has always been close to Israel when both were in the Middle East. All right? O house of Israel, can I not do with you even as this potter, says the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you, O house of Israel. Okay? Now notice verse 7. Because here it shows God has given free moral agency to the people and the nations. Okay. If at any time I speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom, to pluck it up, to pull it down, to destroy it. Now look at all that the nations that have come and gone. And you go back and you look at Daniel, the second chapter, with the statue of the great empires starting with the head of gold and all the way down to the toes and the, and the clay. Pluck it up to destroy it. All right? If. So God always gives warning. God always gives a chance of repentance. Now you look in the Bible, and what is the only nation that ever repented? Assyria. Read the book of Jonah. Israel never repented, though they were the chosen people of God, and that's not just the Jews. Okay? Now notice verse 8. If that nation, that means any nation, remember the rise and fall of nations, the rise and fall of nations. Okay? If that nation against whom I have spoken will turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil I thought to do to them. 
Okay, how does God bring evil? By using other people. By using armies of nations. Verse 9. And if at any time I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom to build it and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight, that it not obey my voice, then I will repent of the good which I said I would do them good. Okay. Now notice. Verse 11, because this is what's transpiring today. Everyone's wanting to know, why are all these problems coming? Why are all these difficulties here? Okay, and we're going to look at one of them that is going to be gigantic. And there is no way that it will be solved quickly. All right. Verse 11. Now, therefore, speak to the men of Judah and to the people of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I'm forming evil against you. We see it unfolding against us now. And devising a plan against you. So what does God do? He offers repentance. But that repentance must be coming to God his way. All right, let's read it. He says, return now each one. Every person. God is talking to every person not only in this nation, but in every nation and every nation on the face of the earth because God made all the people and at the end times, they're going to be all involved with all of the things that are taking place. So what are they going to do? How many are going to repent? How many are going to turn to God? What's going to happen? Return now each one from his own evil way and make your ways and doings good. Okay. What does that mean? All right, let's come to the book of Amos. Let's come to chapter 4. Let's begin in verse 6. Chapter 4. Then we'll see what God says, and then we will see what he requires, since they're not converted, to do good to hold back the hand of God's correction. Right? Verse 6. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places, yet you have not returned to me. Now we're going to see that. Lack of food, lack of things in the store, inflation, worthless money. Verse 7. I have withheld the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest. We've seen the drought. Then we've seen too much rain, okay? I've caused the rain to fall on one city and caused it not to rain on another city. One field was rained upon, and the field on which it did not rain upon dried up. So two or three cities wandered into one city to drink. So we've seen that, and that's going to happen again. But they were not satisfied, yet... Notice what he says, second time. You have not returned to me, says the Lord. Notice God gives chance after chance after chance after chance. So the question today becomes, how many more chances do we have? Okay. Verse 9. I have stricken you with blessing and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your, your trees and your olive trees increased the creeping locusts devoured them, yet you have not returned to me. Third time. Let's read on. I've sent a plague among you, and we have many plagues after the manner of Egypt. Look at the sicknesses we have. Look at all the drugs that we have. Look at Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, uh, Chicago, New York, 
Philadelphia, Baltimore, drugs just sold on the market openly and killing people. Will they return to God? No, they haven't. I've slain your young men with the sword, and we can add in there, and with the drugs, and have taken away your horses. I have made the stench of your camps to come up into your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Okay, that's number four. All right, let's read the next verse. I've overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked out of the burning, and yet you have not returned to me. Now notice verse 12. With all these national problems, it's not just a political thing. It is a spiritual thing and a coming to God his way. Okay, verse 12. Therefore, I will do this to you, O Israel, and because I do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. And what does that mean? You're going to meet God with all of the troubles that are coming down. How far off that is? We don't know, but we do have to speak the words of God concerning these things because it's important, okay? Let's come to chapter 5, verse 4. Here's the first thing. Thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and you shall live. Do not seek Bethel. Now, what is Bethel? Bethel was the center of the false worship, supposedly of God, but it was to Baal and the golden calf. And not enter into Gilgal, and do not pass to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into exile, Beersheba shall come to nothing. Okay? So don't go to those places that are going to be totally wasted. Now, we could, I can think of one which I'm concerned about, and that's San Francisco. How many have seen the reports on San Francisco? How many know what lies right under San Francisco? The San Andreas fault line. I wonder how soon it's going to be that that breaks loose and all hell is going to transpire in San Francisco. It is already a ghost city because of the policies of lawlessness and drugs and people are moving out of it as fast as they can and businesses are closing down and the streets are empty except for the crap and the pee and the drug needles. Okay? Verse 6, seek the Lord and you shall live, lest he break out like a fire on the house of Israel and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. You who turn judgment into wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth. So that tells you who this is going to come upon. And how many are, is that? Look at how many people are trying to solve a lot of these problems. And in some, they're coming back to God a little bit, but they've got to come back to God more. Okay. All right. So here's the third time. Seek him who created the Pleiades, Orion, and who turned the deep darkness into morning, and to him who darkened the day into night. All right. That is God. Seek him who calls for waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. 
So there it is. One, two, three, four. Number five, verse 14. Seek the good and not evil, that you may live, says the Lord. The God of hosts shall be with you as you have spoken. Hate the evil. Not embrace it. Not replace the word of God with it. Hate the evil. Love the good. Establish judgment in the gate. And that better begin right in Washington, D.C. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph, which is who we are. Okay. Now let's see one of the great problems that we're going to face. Let's come to Deuteronomy 28. This is a never-ending problem that is not going to go away. It is not going to be quickly solved, and it is going to be very difficult indeed. Okay? So let's read it. Verse 43. Deuteronomy 28, and how many times have we been here? And how many times have we warned that this would happen? But look at it now. The cartels are here as soldiers with weapons. And if one of an American citizen shoots one of them, he'll be tried and convicted of murder trying to protect his property. Okay, let's read it, because I don't think we have grasped the magnitude of what's going to happen. All right. Verse 43, the stranger dwelling among you shall get above you very high, and you shall come down very low. Now, what does that mean? Huh? Well, think about what the governor of Massachusetts said just yesterday to solve the problem of the immigrants. And they only have a few thousand there in Massachusetts. She said, we can't afford it. We're appealing for funds. And if any of you would like to open up your house to take some of the immigrants in, that would help a great deal. Okay? Other places they're going to come, and if there's an empty house, they're going to move in it, and no one's going to get them out of it. So think what is going to happen. Think what's going to happen when there's a scarcity of food. Think what's going to happen when the federal money runs out to support the 8 million that are already here under the Biden administration, and they are sent here by God as punishment for this nation. Now then he says, you shall come down very low and he shall loan to you. Now, that's about the lending with the, with the finances that we have covered. Okay, verse 45. And all these curses. So you go back and you read the whole first part of, and then the whole chapter of Deuteronomy 28. And all these curses, let's put it because people, oh, we don't like the word curse. All right, put punishment. How's that? You be happy with that? All these curses shall come upon you and shall pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. That's why. And you didn't serve God joyfully. All right. Now, 
Let's look at it on a national basis. Let's come to Leviticus 26. Now remember, just like where we started. Now I don't know how much of a mass repentance there could really be in America. I don't know how we can break through all of the censoring that goes on by the establishment against anyone who speaks the truth from the Bible. But it needs to be spoken and it needs to be said. Let's begin in verse 1. Let's see what God thinks is very important to receive the blessings of God, because that's what everyone wants, right? You shall not make an idol to yourselves. You shall not set up for yourselves graven images or a standing pillar, and you shall not set up any image of stone in your land in order to bow down uh, to it, for I am the Lord your God. Now notice, first thing, you shall keep my Sabbath. That's what God wants. Okay. Oh, everybody wants to go keep Sunday. Well, why would you want to keep Sunday when God didn't say anything about Sunday? Why are people so hateful against the Sabbath? Because they believe the lies of the Protestant and Catholic teachers, which then come directly out of the mouth of Satan, the devil. Okay? So, as John wrote in 1 John 3, when you do that, are you a child of God or a child of the devil? Huh? Whose child are you? Let's go on. You shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Okay? And then it says, you'll have blessings overflowing. All right? Remember what God said? Jeremiah 18. If you will return to me. And as we read in Amos 4, five times return to me, but they didn't. And then five times the things they could do to seek God. Now, if that doesn't happen, let's come to verse 14. So here's the choice. God always gives choice. But if you will not hearken to me and will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, and if your heart hate your soul rather, hates my judgments, so that you will not do all the commandments, so that you break my covenant. Now think about that in relationship to Israel, and then think about that in relationship to the church and our covenant with Christ, our covenant with God the Father. Okay. I will do this to you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, burning fever, consuming the eyes, causing sorrow of heart, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. That's what China wants. China wants all of American food. Now notice this. How close are we to this point here in verse 17? And I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. And they that hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when none pursues. And if you will not yet for all of this hearken to me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sin. And you read the rest of the chapter. It is not a lovely chapter. It is difficult. All right? Let's see what we are to do. Because God looks down upon us. 
Okay. Now, let's come to Jeremiah, the sixth chapter, for just a minute. And God speaks to the congregation that is in the middle of all of this suffering that is going on in Jeremiah, the sixth chapter. And, of course, that means we need to prepare for the difficult days that are coming. See? We can't sit back and let it come and then say, oh, I wish I would have done this or that or the other. Okay. We don't know what God will do because in Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, you can put that down in your notes. God says that when the difficulties before they come, God is going to send an angel to put a mark on the forehead of all of those who sigh and cry for all the sins and plagues that's coming upon Israel, and he will spare them. Okay. Now, do we want God to spare us? Yes, indeed. Then also there's a, there's, are those who will go to a place of safety. We don't know who's going to go, but God will take them when they're ready. So that means that we've got to be faithful to God. Okay. Here in Jeremiah, the sixth chapter, let's pick it up in verse 17. I also set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the ram's horn. But they said, We will not hearken. So what you can say is this. Whenever something like I'm giving as a message today, whoever, whether they are and there are even some Protestant ministers speaking out against all the things that are going on, which you have to give them credit for, but returning to Sunday is not returning to God. All right? But they said, we will not hearken. Therefore hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, that's us, the people of God, what I will do to them. Verse 19, hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts. Now notice, God doesn't do it in an unjust way. So, for us, what are our thoughts? What are we thinking on, those of us in the churches of God? What are the thoughts of those in the world that God hasn't called? How evil are their thoughts? Well, if 64% of single women want abortion, what is that? Is that not murder in the heart? Yes, indeed. Fruit of their thoughts because they have not hearkened to my words nor to my law, but have rejected it. So that's what's going to happen. God is giving this nation a chance, an opportunity. We don't know if, how many will respond. We don't know how many will come to God the way that they should. Okay, But what we need to understand is that God wants us to draw close to him all the time. And so we need to ask God every day for a protection of his angels for understanding of his word, for giving us wisdom and discernment that we don't get ourselves in trouble. Okay? So let's come here to 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, and let's see how we have to function in this world. And we need to stay close to God so that we will know what we need to do. Now then, it's very important for us to understand. And here's a great principle we can apply to everything that we do. We cannot take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that which appears good and try and attach it to the tree of life and expect it to come out good. 
because it won't. Because the good from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil still always ends in disaster. The good that comes from God is the righteousness of God. So in the midst of all of this, we need to pray, is there going to be a repentance and how much so? And how much of a part of this does God want us to play? And how is that going to work out? We don't know. We have to put it all in God's hands. But in the meantime, here is what we need to understand. Okay. Verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Okay. Now, that doesn't apply just to marriage. That applies to other things. Because you can't serve two masters. Okay. For what do righteousness and lawlessness have in common? Now, one of the things I'm going to bring tomorrow to conference is what is lawlessness? Because lawlessness can come in different forms. Because Look at what happened to worldwide. Look at what happened when they brought in the doctrines of the world. Okay? All right? And what fellowship does light have with darkness? None. Okay? We need to keep that in mind. Stay close to God. In prayer, in study, in living, in understanding, in every way. Okay. And what union does Christ have with Belial? See? None of the doctrines of Protestantism and Catholicism are the true doctrines of God. They're all combined with the knowledge from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in philosophy and tradition. Question. How many are really going to leave that? But we can't come to them and compromise the gospel in an attempt to get them to come to us so we can have more numbers. See? Okay. That won't work. And that's what, they're, that's what they're concentrated on now. Oh, well, we need to accept the homosexuals because God loves everybody. Okay? Then they come into the church, and now then, two men come up to the minister and say, will you marry us? Now, what are you going to do? Okay? Or two women. Okay? Or what part does a believer have with an unbeliever? And what agreement is there between a temple of God and idols? Okay. Now then he says, we're a temple of God right after that. For you are a temple of the living God. Exactly as God has said. Okay. Remember this. Having the Holy Spirit of God and understanding the Word of God is so absolutely wonderful and powerful. So while all of these things are going on around us and we can analyze and see what is happening and know why, we need to stay closer to God. Anybody we can help that really wants to know an answer and how to come out of these problems, fine. We'll help them, we'll teach them, we'll provide for them, and hope that they come to repentance and baptism. Okay? And here's why we're a temple of God. Exactly as God said, I will dwell in them. And remember, go back and read John 14, that the Father in Christ will be dwelling within us. 
That is the great thing that God wants us to understand. So keep that in the forefront of your minds with all of the difficulties that are taking place around us on every side. Okay? I will dwell in them and walk in them and will be their God and they shall be my people. Okay? That's the whole plan of God right there in that one verse. Okay, for all of you who like summaries, there you go. <laughs> Here's the one verse that tells you all. Okay. Therefore, come out from the midst of them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean, and I will receive you. That's what it means to be with God. And we have to maintain that relationship every day. That's why there's prayer. That's why there's study. That's why there's overcoming. That's why there are tests and trials and difficulties. That's why we're asked to pray for people who have afflictions or sickness or disease that, of the brethren that God will heal them and raise them up. And you have to be persistent to, in prayer that some things take a lot longer than other things, see? And people have to, have to come to God and help them in their trials because why are they going through trials? Every trial we go through is to help bring us closer to God, even though while we're going through it, we might seem a little further from God than we ought to be, see? But when you get through it, then you look back on it and you can see that God used that to help you grow in knowledge and understanding. Okay. Now verse 17. Okay. Therefore come out from the midst of them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean, and I will receive you, and I shall be a father to you. Now notice this. This is the most important thing that we have direct connection to God the Father and Jesus Christ right within us with the Holy Spirit of God and through prayer and study all the time. Okay? And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Think about that. See? All of these things that we've covered with all the disasters and all of the sins and all of the abominations of the things that are going to be in the world. And the thing that is important for us is that we stay faithful to God and love God with all our heart and mind and soul and being. See? And we can repeat that every day. That's part of my prayer every day for all of us, that we love God that way and stay close to God. Because God has a glorious thing for us. And we are going to take over the world and rule the world and eliminate war, eliminate sickness, eliminate disease, because we will all have the power and authority from God the Father and Jesus Christ to do that. So we need to keep that in mind, even though all these things are transpiring around us. So let us take all of this to mind and ask God for his blessing and goodness and kindness.